for streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, wanted for war crimes. This was a mass grave that contained the bodies of Ukrainian soldiers. It's written on the wooden cross which marked it, 17 men from Izium from the morgue. And prosecutors say that one of the bodies showed signs of torture. The international court issues an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin for alleged Ukrainian war crimes. But will he have to face a trial? Plus... The media was so cruel to me. I was so just embarrassed and uh, hurt and mortified. Turning her struggles into strength, Paris Hilton on the emotional trauma she says she endured over the years and how she's transformed that fight into a message of resilience. And we go into the ring where warriors are molded and exported to some of the most well-known professional wrestling companies in the world. We introduce you to the Monster Factory. Big Show, Bam Bam, Bigelow, you name it, they're here. This is the legacy of the Monster Factory. Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including the attack thwarted when police arrested an axe-wielding man moments before a St. Patrick's Day parade. Plus, the Trump confidant now being called before a grand jury investigating the former president and the urgent investigation underway after a home explodes. Our correspondents are across the world right now covering all of it for us. But we are going to begin with that arrest warrant issued by the International Criminal Court against Russian President Vladimir Putin The Hague, accusing Putin of war crimes, specifically abducting children from Ukraine and forcing them into Russia. The Kremlin calling the warrant outrageous and the court's decision legally void. The warrant comes as new research out of Yale identifies 6,000 Ukrainian children taken to Russian facilities since the beginning of the war, including orphans. It's an issue we've been reporting on extensively here on Prime. And the world will be watching next week as China's President Xi visits Moscow for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. But will this warrant make any kind of difference whatsoever? James Longman leads us off tonight from Ukraine. Tonight, humiliation for Vladimir Putin, the International Criminal Court issuing an arrest warrant for the Russian president seeking to put him behind bars. Judges at The Hague alleging Putin has committed a war crime for the unlawful transfer of children from occupied areas of Ukraine to the Russian Federation. It is forbidden by international law for occupied powers to transfer civilians from the territory they live in to other territories. Children enjoy special protection under the Geneva Convention. The US State Department says thousands of children and perhaps over a million adults have allegedly been forcibly deported from Ukraine to Russia. But the foreign ministry in Moscow has brushed off the warrant, calling the court's decisions legally null and void. The arrest warrant, perhaps just the beginning of the international community's efforts to bring Putin to justice. Vice President Kamala Harris last month accused Russian forces of committing crimes against humanity in places like Bucha, citing murder, torture and rape. Let's stand here talking to you. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five bodies in this tiny room in this basement where Ukrainians say people have been tortured and I can see their hands behind their backs. It is a truly apocalyptic scene. It's just absolutely horrific in here. And this is what Ukraine says is happening across this country. Yet today, Putin sought to present himself as commander, not criminal. He announced he'll host China's President Xi on Monday for a state visit. The Kremlin saying the two leaders plan to sign joint declarations, deepening, quote, strategic cooperation. Putin hoping that translates into assistance on the battlefield that his depleted forces badly need. But Xi has positioned himself as a peacemaker in recent weeks, and he can't do that if, as some fear, he does the Kremlin's bidding. Also today, after months of asking, Ukraine now being promised fighter jets. Poland and Slovakia in the last 36 hours have become the first two NATO allies to promise immediate delivery of Soviet-era MiG fighter jets. Phil, the National Security Council issued a statement a short while ago to ABC News saying there is no doubt that Russia is committing war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine. And we've been clear that those responsible must be held accountable. Phil. 
Our thanks to James for that. And one city in Ukraine where we have seen possible evidence of war crimes is Izium, where Ukrainian forces managed to push out Russian troops but discovered a burial ground that was left behind. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge was there when those mass graves were first excavated. The area becoming a giant crime scene. Forensic teams carefully exhuming hundreds of dead bodies from the ground. Ukrainian officials saying many of the victims met a violent death and some of the bodies show signs of torture. Well, the forensic team here have just removed the body of a man from one of the unmarked graves and it's obvious that he had his hands tied behind his back. All right, and for more on what happens next, let's bring in Vanderbilt University professor Michael Newton, an army officer, an expert on war crimes, who has worked with the ICC. Professor, thanks so much for being with us. We, we appreciate no, it. No Let, problem, Phil. Good to be here. Let's start by breaking down exactly what this arrest warrant means coming from The Hague, especially when Russia says they don't recognize the court. Well, number one, it means everything. It means the game has changed for Vladimir Putin as of tonight. And this line, we don't recognize the court attacking the legitimacy, goes back throughout history, whether it's Saddam Hussein, Herman Goering, Charles Taylor, they all say that. They lost the right to say that the day that they crossed the Ukrainian border and began to commit war crimes. Full stop. President Zelensky called this an historic decision from which historical responsibility will begin. Strong statement, but the ICC doesn't have its own police force. So how does this type of warrant lead to the actual arrest, if it does, of Vladimir Putin? Does this arrest warrant have teeth? Well, that's the important question going forward. It has a huge political significance. Vladimir Putin today, uh, as well as other officials in the future, will be marked as war criminals or alleged war criminals. And so now you've moved from the political and the polemic and the propaganda into the realm of the law. So by law and ICC jurisprudence, any state party to the court that he travels to has the duty to arrest him. Any non-state party that he travels to that's not a member of the court will be under enormous political pressure and, and I think in the end actual domestic pressures. You know, the question for domestic governments is very simple. Do you stand on the side of, of rulers who kidnap children from their parents or not? That's a pretty heated political question, but that's where we are right now. Yeah, and you, you just bring up the heart of the matter. Tell us a little bit more about the specific war crime accusation against Putin. It's abducting children from Ukraine and forcing them into Russian facilities. I mean, we've seen mass graves, you know, alleged mass graves, uh, but this is specifically about the children. Well, for the moment, it's about the children. There are thousands of war crimes cases underway, and the Ukrainians have prosecuted a number. There are many, many more under investigation. But for the moment, it is what, what we would say in layman's terms, kidnapping children. In legal terms, it's the grave breach of, of forcible deportation. They're taking people that under the Geneva Conventions are entitled to be called protected persons. They're protected by the force of law. They're protected by human rights law. They're protected by the Geneva Conventions. And they're literally forcibly uh, taking them back to Russia against their will and against the will of their parents. Those are war crimes. Those are grave breaches under the Geneva Conventions and consistent perfectly within the, 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 the substantive jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, no doubt. The average American wouldn't have any kind of measure of you know, how long it takes, but, but you know so much more about this. Uh, did it surprise you that it has taken this long or was this pretty quick in this realm? Well, it's, it's a matter of cooperation. Remember that it's an integrated architecture. So domestic officials around the world are busy investigating their cases. The ICC is busy investigating their cases. And I think that's the, that's the thing to remember. It takes as much time as it takes to do it right. Beyond a reasonable doubt, with a presumption of innocence, with full body of evidence admitted into court, this is not a political process. From now on, this is a legal process governed by very tight rules of evidence, very tight rules of procedure. This is a legal process from henceforth. So honestly, it takes as much time as it takes. The ICC has just begun to investigate in a formal way uh, after uh, the February invasion from last year. And I, this is just the first of other cases to come 
both for the ICC and for other countries, and of course for Ukraine, who continues to be busy investigating and building trial-ready, courtroom-ready cases. Right, and we'll be, we'll be watching this play out, of course. Professor Michael Newton, thanks so much for your time. No problem, thank you. Okay, now to the alleged plot here at home with authorities revealing a plan they say was targeting St. Patrick's Day. The FBI arresting a suspect in Yonkers, New York, accusing him of threatening to kill police officers during tomorrow's parade. Suspect allegedly posting alarming messages on social media. Here's ABC's investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky. Tonight on this St. Patrick's Day, the FBI arresting this axe-wielding man for threatening to attack police officers marching in Saturday's St. Patrick's Day parade in Yonkers. The message is, is clear. It will be taken seriously, and you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. That's what we do. In online posts, federal prosecutors say Ridon Kola mentioned jihad, referenced ISIS, and expressed support for Cephalo Saipov, who carried out the 2017 bike path terror attack in New York City that killed eight people. Saipov was recently sentenced to life in prison. Earlier this month, court records quoted a message Kola allegedly sent to Yonkers police saying, I will crucify Yonkers cops and their bosses all along McLean Avenue. It will be a horror scene. McLean Avenue is where Saturday's parade steps off. A few days later, Kola posted this picture of himself with an axe and a caption in Albanian that says, Come on, Judas, I'm waiting for you. Aaron Katursky joins me now. Aaron, what's happened with this suspect and will the parade go on? Oh, the parade is very much going on tomorrow as scheduled. The suspect is now being held without bail pending a, a hearing next week, Phil. And the mayor tonight says that these threats are not going to curtail the community celebration of Irish Americans. So they'll be on McLean Avenue on Saturday as scheduled. Phil. All right, Aaron, thank you. Next tonight, to concern over the stability of America's banks still being felt across the country, specifically on Wall Street, one week after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, its former parent company now filing for bankruptcy, and there is a new report tonight that claims First Republic executives sold $12 million in stock months before the crash. Ariel Resha reports. Tonight, Wall Street closing out the week with a rocky ride. Stock plunging nearly 400 points, even after that $30 billion rescue of the troubled First Republic Bank by the country's biggest banks. There's still a lot of angst in the marketplace. I think there are some investors uh, worried that we may see a bank failure or two this weekend. President Biden today pushing Congress to impose tougher penalties on executives at failed banks, including giving regulators the power to claw back gains from their stock sales. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again. It comes after a report from the Wall Street Journal that executives at First Republic sold $12 million in stock in the months leading up to its crash. But that bank is still operating and those executives are still in charge. First Republic telling us they have no comment on those stock sales. I feel confident that the regulators are looking at this and I, again, I would be surprised if they weren't. Today, the parent company of Silicon Valley filing for bankruptcy as the Department of Justice and the SEC investigate its leadership. CEO Greg Becker sold nearly $3.6 million in stock just days before the bank collapsed. Sources tell ABC News the FBI is looking into whether there is evidence of insider trading. And Ariel Reshef joins us now. Ariel, the Biden administration is asking Congress to take further action here, right? That's right, Phil. The White House is asking Congress to empower the FDIC to impose fines on those executives of failed banks and to bar them from holding jobs in the industry. Phil? All right. Ariel, thank you. We turn now to some new questions about the possible origins of COVID-19. An international team of scientists now looking at some new data. And they say they've discovered genetic links tying the pandemic to another animal in Wuhan, China, and not a lab. ABC's Stephanie Ramos with the details. Tonight, new evidence that COVID-19 may have originated from natural animal to human transmission after new analysis suggests a link from the virus to raccoon dogs at China's Wuhan market. This is another big brick in a huge wall of evidence pointing to this market as the epicenter uh, and to wildlife uh, as the, the source of 
this pandemic. The findings first reported by The Atlantic after researcher Michael Warby and a group of scientists analyzed new data uploaded just days ago into a global database by researchers at China's CDC. That data, including swab samples taken in and around Wuhan market back in January of 2020. We found some pretty interesting things, including raccoon dog and other mammal DNA and samples that have SARS-CoV-2. The preliminary findings and data not yet published or peer-reviewed. Tonight, the WHO and experts say the findings are strong evidence, but do not prove conclusively raccoon dogs transmitted the virus to humans or had COVID-19 themselves. This data do not provide a definitive answer to the question of how the pandemic began. The news coming amid fierce debate over where the virus came from. The Department of Energy now joining the FBI, saying with low confidence they suspect the pandemic most likely started with a lab leak in China. And Stephanie Ramos joins me now. Stephanie, this new information is also renewing questions about transparency when it comes to the origin of COVID. It really is, Phil. Chinese researchers reportedly uploaded that data and then for some reason took it down after that international team was able to analyze it. The WHO is now calling for China to share any and all information relating to COVID-19 and its origin. Phil. All right, Stephanie, thank you. A federal judge has ruled one of the lawyers for former President Trump must provide additional testimony before a federal grand jury investigating Trump's handling of classified documents. Trump's spokesperson did not immediately respond to our request for comment. A 17-year-old has been arrested in the fatal shooting of a transgender woman as Houston police continue to search for a second suspect. Maricela Castro was found lying in the road outside of a home in July of 2022. According to police, Castro and another person had just gotten out of her car when they were shot. The two male suspects took off in Castro's car before ditching it nearby. The teen, who was 16 at the time of the shooting, is now in custody on capital murder charge. Police would not comment on a possible motive. Now to the battle over TikTok. Sources telling ABC News that the Justice Department is launching an investigation into the owners of the popular social media app for allegedly spying on journalists. The news follows an apparent uh, warning from the Biden administration to potentially ban TikTok if its Chinese parent company doesn't sell its stake. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the China-based company that owns TikTok under investigation by the FBI for allegedly spying on American citizens. Sources telling ABC News the Justice Department is looking into whether ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, was tracking and mining information about reporters who covered the tech industry. This is the nation's top intelligence official warns that TikTok makes Americans vulnerable to spying. One third of Americans get their news from TikTok every single day. One sixth of American youth say they're constantly on TikTok. That's a, that's a loaded gun. The fear that TikTok has been vacuuming volumes of personal detailed information about all those users. Information that could be exploited by China to manipulate what Americans think. And sources tell ABC News the Biden administration is threatening to ban TikTok completely unless the Chinese owners give up their stake. But some lawmakers say just ban it now. For me personally, I think they need to be gone. Uh, that you know, China's our number one adversary. We need to protect ourselves. TikTok officials have said in recent days that they are addressing the privacy concerns about Americans and that forcing the China-based parent company to divest would not address the security concerns raised by U.S. officials. Phil? Pierre, thank you. And still much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, a home left in pieces, the latest on the investigation into an explosion that rocked a neighborhood. He is a successful writer and actor, but most Ted Lasso fans know him simply as Coach Beard. Brendan Hunt tells us about what could be the show's final season and if we've seen the last of his character. But next, she's lived decades of her life in the spotlight. Paris Hilton is now revealing private battles with childhood trauma. The media was so cruel to me. I was so just embarrassed and uh, hurt and mortified. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. The whole world saw me as a sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. It was almost like you were hiding in plain sight. I just wanted to be someone else. But when you tell your truth and let things go, it really will help heal you. In her own words, this is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. Welcome back. Vulnerable, revealing, and pained. It is a side of Paris Hilton that you may never have seen before. The heiress and paparazzi princess goes into stunning detail about her life and trauma that she says she hid from the world. How she says she crafted a persona to hide her pain in plain sight. Here's ABC's Juju Chang. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. You might think you know Paris Hilton. I'm very shy. No one would guess that about you. No one would guess that, no. Yeah. But I'm extremely, extremely shy. But behind the glittery backdrop of the paparazzi princess. That's it, that's it, after him, no more. No, no. I just felt that the whole world saw me as the sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. She says was the real Paris. I created this character inside of this place because I just wanted to be someone else. As we continue to examine how young women in the limelight were treated 20 years ago, in her new self-titled memoir, the pop culture icon now flipping her narrative on its head. You had a caricature of yourself with the high voice and the, you know, rich, spoiled brat persona. Was that really you? No, that was a trauma response and kind of created this almost Barbie doll fantasy life. A response to the unspeakable abuse and anguish she says she endured as a teenager that helped shape who she is today. She became the it girl of the early on. Her face all over the tabloids. Everyone thinks Nicole and I are these two girls who've never worked a day in their life. Mocked as famous for being famous, most notably for her reality TV show, The Simple Life. That's hot. Two decades later, her influence remains undeniable, constantly reinventing herself. She says it all stems from a painful place. You said this is like taking a sledgehammer to the wall of silence and shame. This whole book is about that. 
It's been extremely healing. Obviously, extremely traumatizing as well, because I think when you go through trauma in life, you don't want to remember it. Paris says school didn't come easy for her and that she had ADHD, but didn't know it at the time. Just being in school and not being able to concentrate and just not understanding why until later on. Like, I wish I would have been diagnosed earlier. In her book, Paris writes that when she was 14 years old, a teacher she knew developed a crush on her. And he gave you compliments? Yes. What kinds of things did he say? How mature I was, how beautiful I was. Um, that other boys my age wouldn't understand. She says eventually she had an encounter with him that would haunt her to this day. Just started calling me almost every night. And um, Ben said, I would love to see you and wanted me to sneak out and meet up with him. And you write, one night he comes over mm -hmm. and you meet him out in his car. What happens? Once we got in the car, he kissed me, and then all of a sudden there was headlights and it was my parents, and then they started chasing our car. We had got, got away and then I came back home and acted like it never happened. You forthrightly write in the book, for 25 years, I framed this as my first kiss, but when you look back on it now, what do you think of it as? I see it as a man grooming a child. Paris says she became a rebellious teen, a risk taker, partying, skipping school. Eventually, her parents, Kathy and Rick Hilton, sent her to multiple so-called emotional growth schools for troubled teens. Before I went to Provo Canyon School, I was such a free spirit. They stole my childhood. Provo Canyon School was the worst experience of my entire life. I can't believe that place is even still open and that they're operating. What do you remember from Provo? Throwing us against walls, strangling, hitting. You talk about having a later a lingering fear of gynecologists because of some of the stuff that you endured. Mm -hmm. What was what was going on? Late at night, they would take certain girls into a room and do cervical exams with male and female staff. And it was not like something that was like a doctor. Like these were just them doing this late at night to girls. Did that happen to you? Yes. Invasive searches and stuff? Yes. I think that was just another way for them to have that power over us and also I think that a lot of them enjoyed it. You said they would watch you showering? Yes, male and female staff would watch the girls shower. Paris recently posted these photos to Instagram, showing her just after leaving those schools when she turned 18, writing, I can see the pain in my eyes. I was so traumatized that I pretended everything was okay, trying to block out the painful memories. When ABC News reached out for comment on Paris Hilton's accusations, it replied with a media statement, which says in part, Provo Canyon School was sold by its previous ownership in August 2000. We therefore cannot comment on the operations or student experience prior to that time. It goes on to add, we do not condone or promote any form of abuse. She believes her traumatic experiences ultimately drew her into toxic relationships, including with a man more than 10 years her senior, which ultimately led to that notorious sex tape. It didn't even occur to me that you were 19, you were a teenager yeah. when that sex tape was made. Yeah. What was the dynamic of that relationship like? I was obviously not in a good headspace, and I think I just met the worst person that I could meet. And then to be exploited like that, where the media was so cruel to me. I was so just embarrassed and uh, hurt and mortified. Three years after it was filmed, the video was released and made its way around the world. Hey, 
It became fodder for tabloids and talk shows. But I do believe that we have evolved as a society, and now we're understanding that this was a huge violation of privacy. In what way do you think you're taking back the narrative on this? I feel that my narrative and story for the past two decades has been told by the media, and with this book, it's a chance for me to take back my own narrative and tell the truth. Paris has gone on to become an advocate, dedicating herself to exposing what she calls the troubled teen industry. Imagine if it was your child who was suffering abuse, neglect or death in the name of treatment. Wouldn't you do everything in your power to protect them? Working to change laws across the country. Being here? Yes. And I hear you may have a bipartisan bill now and testifying to Utah legislators. I am proof that money doesn't protect against abuse. It's been the most empowering time of my life, really turning my pain into a purpose and having this mission. And I feel that it will make it all worth it, everything I went through, if I can stop it from happening to other children. The Paris sitting here today at 42 is living life on her own terms. She's now married, a mother, and one of the highest paid DJs in the world. In the moment, what are you feeling? It's such a magical feeling. I just feel empowered, I feel excited, and I feel safe up there as well. What would you tell young women today and, and that young Paris? I would tell her that you're going to go through a lot in life, but one day you're gonna take everything that you've learned and use it for the power of good to help others. Our thanks to Nightline's Juju Chang. The full interview, Paris Hilton, in her own words, is available to watch on Nightline Impact now on Hulu. Still much more to get to coming up. It's unsightly amidst the smell of rotten eggs and is drifting toward a coastal state. The 5,000 mile long bloom and the threat it could pose. But next, many people making $100,000 a year say they are still living paycheck to paycheck. We're gonna take a closer look at why some six figure salaries are still not enough by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charging a sweeping 56-count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip-hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip-hop on trial. Only on Hulu. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? 
work. Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. The whole world saw me as a sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. It was almost like you were hiding in plain sight. I just wanted to be someone else. But when you tell your truth and let things go, it really will help heal you. Paris Hilton, in her own words, this is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Like it or not, tax season is here, and a new study is shining a light on a pretty cold reality. That six-figure salary that you dreamed about may not be cutting it. Here's a closer look by the numbers. The survey, published by financial advice company Smart Asset, found that 51% of people who earn more than $100,000 report living paycheck to paycheck. That's a 7% spike in just the last 12 months. Now, we know one factor, of course, at play here is inflation which isn't helping anyone at 6% year over year. But it's also your zip code and the taxes you pay. So they looked at 76 of the largest American cities to see how earnings really stack up. After taxes and adjusted for the cost of living, a $100,000 annual income in New York City amounts to just $35,791. By the way, Honolulu and San Francisco aren't much better. Based on the same factors, the yearly take home in Home of the Blues, Memphis, Tennessee, would be $86,444. That's the best they found. Or maybe just move to Texas. Thanks to no state income tax and a cheaper cost of living, seven out of the top 10 cities in that survey can be found in the Lone Star State. And we want to note the median, median U.S. salary last year was about $44,225, according to Zipia, which raises serious concerns about how many Americans are struggling in this economy. And just a civic reminder, Tuesday, April 18th is tax day this year. We have much more here ahead on Prime. Are sandwiches actually good for you? How to make sure your favorite snack isn't hurting your health. And turning regular people into monsters. The team behind some of the biggest names in pro wrestling on how they train and why the scripted moves don't really mean the pain isn't real. It's entertainment. It's an escape. There's no cut. There's no stunt doubles. There's none of that. be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. 
the historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. The whole world saw me as a sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. It was almost like you were hiding in plain sight. I just wanted to be someone else. But when you tell your truth and let things go, it really will help heal you. Paris Hilton, in her own words, this is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back. Former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes is back in court. The urgent investigation after a home explodes and why your sandwich could be hurting your health. Those stories and more in tonight's rundown. Former Theranos chief Elizabeth Holmes made what might be her final court appearance before beginning an 11 year prison sentence, unless a judge grants her request to remain free while her lawyers appeal her conviction for masterminding a blood testing hoax. Holmes was sentenced for duping investors in Theranos, a startup she founded 20 years ago and rode to fleeting fame and fortune on her promises of a revolutionary blood testing technology. The hearing ended without a decision on whether Holmes will be able to stay out of prison while her appeal unfolds or have her surrender on April 27th as currently scheduled. The judge said he hopes to issue his ruling in early April. Michigan officials have confirmed that they are investigating a possible explosion at a home. Fire crews say the owners were not home at the time. While their two dogs were inside, they made it out and were taken to the Humane Society. Fire crews were able to put out the flames within an hour. They believe it was started by a gas leak, but have yet to confirm. The former Minneapolis police officer convicted of killing George Floyd appeared in court remotely, pleading guilty to two counts of tax evasion. Derek Chauvin and his now ex-wife were charged with underreporting their income and failing to file tax returns. His ex-wife pleaded guilty earlier to two counts. The charges were originally filed against Chauvin shortly after Floyd's killing in May 2020. YouTube announced it will restore former President Trump's channel. It's been over two years since Mr. Trump's account was suspended following the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The former president was kicked off several social media platforms for his posts around the time of the insurrection. His account had over 2.6 million subscribers. It's unsightly, it smells, and it's washing up on our beaches in great amounts. This thick, bushy seaweed known as sargassum is coming in earlier than usual, and this year's bloom is massive. Satellite imagery shows that it is about 5,000 miles wide. Sky 10 captured some seaweed over Hallover Beach, in Sunny Isles, Hollywood Beach, and on Fort Lauderdale Beach. That is moving westward. 
towards the Caribbean region and will be making its way to the Gulf of Mexico and South Florida. It's a decade long problem. There was a big uptick in 2014, 2019, and it looks like this year could be the largest sargassum bloom recorded. For now, tourists and locals don't seem to be bothered by the seaweed. Now they're coming for my sandwich. Experts say refined flour in white breads can cause glucose spikes, raising blood sugar and insulin. Sodium and preservatives in processed deli meat can increase the risk of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. According to an analysis of federal data done by the Wall Street Journal, sandwiches are the number one source of sodium and saturated fat in American diets, making up about one-fifth of our daily sodium intake and 19% of our daily saturated fat calories. So instead of the white bread, we're gonna swap it out for whole grain. Whole grain is a great source of fiber. It has antioxidants in it. Also, it's associated to lowering that LDL, that bad cholesterol. And then next up, we can move to the meat. So instead of the processed deli meat, which can be high in nitrates, which we know are associated with various forms of cancer, specifically colorectal cancer, mm -hmm. we can switch it out for chicken. You can either pre-bake chicken if you're gonna meal prep, wrap a rotisserie chicken. I think it's honestly a more uh, a hearty piece of meat. It's gonna keep you more full. And then moving on to cheese. Instead of American cheese, we can switch it out for mozzarella cheese or Swiss cheese. Mozzarella cheese is a great source of a natural probiotic, which is great for our gut health. Uh -huh. And then lastly, mayonnaise. This is where you're gonna cut a lot of calories. So instead of mayonnaise, there's no real substitute for mayonnaise. But if you want the texture, I love hummus. I put it on everything. I probably eat it once a day. So the British soccer team we all missed is finally back. The two-time Emmy-winning series, Ted Lasso, has returned for its third season on Apple TV. Let's take a look. Hey, Coach, I don't know about you, but kind of feels like it's getting a little stuffy in here. Yeah? Like one of those days you want to have class outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what the f*** are you two talking about? We are outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there he is. Brendan Hunt joins us. Brendan, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Those who love the show and watch the show know you, you play Coach Beard, who is really Ted Lasso's rock through the series. Um, that chemistry, you're also a writer of the show. Uh, that chemistry is, I, I think, one of the things that makes the show so special. Um, when you were writing it, was that the plan? To, to lean into chemistry of, yeah. of, of Beard and Ted? Um, yes and no. Like, you know, Beard is just there for Ted. He's gonna fill in the blanks of whatever Ted needs. And since Ted is really good at talking, Beard doesn't have to do that much. So he's just, you know, verbally anyway. So he's just there to be the ready, steady rock of support. The series comes back after Kitman turned assistant coach Nate leaves AFC Richmond behind, tearing up that famous uh, Believe sign. How do you think audiences are going to be impacted by that happening at the end of the season and where it's obviously going, if I'm reading between the lines correctly? I, I think almost like that week, Jason was like, I think he's got to tear up the Believe sign. And we're like, whoa, <laughs> okie dokie. Um, but I love it because, you know, we, there's... There's this sort of like internal mythology now around the show and that belief sign. And I think, you know, part of what we're doing is, is, is tearing down icons anyway and like, you know, making sure people are, are looking internally as opposed to externally for things. Right, the importance of what you assign to it. You think we'll see another sign? Uh, well, according to the trailers I've seen, there's another sign in the office. So something's happened there, but we'll see. We'll just have to see. Yeah, I get it. You're not going to give me anything for the third <laughs> no, season. I get I, it. So I don't care if you bring me another... <laughs> Transparent desk. What is this? Perspex? Can't do it, Phil. I think it's trans. Yeah, I'm not sure what material this is, but yeah, you can see through it. Um, all right, so th this is in, in, in the second season, you address some more serious issues. And I think, I think that's kind of the genius in the writing. The whole first season, people are laughing. They're falling in love with the characters. You see some, some panic attacks with Ted, and then you actually address it. Uh, in the second season, mm -hmm. whether it's anxiety or therapy, you address that. And you, do you, did you get any feedback from from fans of the show? Did they did they like that turn? Um, I mean, the feedback we've gotten from people on this show is so uniquely moving, you know, and has been from the beginning, you know, for various reasons. But uh, when we added the the therapy element, heard back from a, a lot of different people about how you know therapy has helped their lives, and some people who were just finally taking the step to start therapy because of the show. In, in a notable episode, uh, a, a episode that, that focused on you at this point, Coach Beard walks alone to gather his thoughts, right, after, um, after losing a game. So let's just take a look at the clip quickly for us. Drop the keys. Oh. Thanks. Rough match, mate. We thought you needed a hug. I thought you needed a hug. 
Do you want to talk about it? We can talk and drink as long as we talk about anything but the game and drink. Have you ever been to Vegas? What's Ted like behind closed doors? How do you cope knowing the universe is infinite, but your consciousness can end in a second? So Ted seems to lean on other people, you being one of them uh, in the show, uh, but you both cope differently. Was that a conscious decision to show two different ways to cope with things? Um, yeah, I mean, we have to draw the, the lines of separation between these guys where we can, you know, um, and, and one is Beard really enjoys surrendering to the night uh, wherever it may take him um, and, uh, and saying yes to whatever door is open uh, to him, even if they take him down the occasional dark alley. Co-star Jason Sudeikis, obviously, uh, said season three is the end of the story that you guys wanted to tell. He, I don't know if he outright said it, but that mm. sounds like that this may be uh, the final season. Whether it is or isn't, you may not even know that right now, mm -hmm. and you may. We, we truly don't. I'm like a lie detector. Give me your, <laughs> let me get your wrist. No, it's, so you truly don't, but it, it, have, has anybody approached you or have you thought about spinoffs to this? Because it is so mm -hmm. wildly successful globally, it, it, it's such a success. Um, well, I think Brett Goldstein, who plays Roy Kent, is on record that he has a, a spinoff he's trying to pitch. Um, and uh, I don't know if Beard's in it. Uh, <laughs> I have not been consulted. We'll Would just you have want to Beard see. to be in it? I mean, I thought Brett and I were friends. Uh, we're going we're <laughs> uh -oh. to find out. Um, uh -oh. But in terms of what happens next, we, we really just don't know. Because, yeah, as you say, we always saw it as like a three-movement suite, basically. And we're at the end of that third movement now. Right. And that will be a kind of end. And then we're going to take a little break because we're tired of each other. Uh, but after that... It could pick up, you know, from where we left off, it could pick up in a new way, or maybe we won't do anything. We really don't know, but, right. but uh, we're coming to an end, and after that, everything's on the table. Right? Uh, Brendan, thank you so much. Thank we you really so. appreciate you coming in. Wish you the best of success, whether you wind up a head coach somewhere or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Thank you. Again, streaming now on Apple TV+. Plus. Attention shoppers, high prices may not be the only thing you need to worry about at the supermarket. Someone actually may be watching you. There's a new movement toward using facial recognition in stores for security, and it's obviously not without controversy. Here's Rhiannon Alley. A supermarket's use of facial recognition is raising privacy concerns. The sign posted outside a Fairway store in New York City reads, customers' biometric data may be collected. It's using a a scan of our eye, or it might be using our facial, you know, our face or a fingerprint. Fairway saying in a statement, the technology is helping our store reduce retail crime. Shoplifting has surged across the country. The number of shoplifting complaints in New York surged to more than 63,000 last year, 45% more than the year before. This is not a city where you can walk into a store, take what you want and walk out. Dozens of large retailers are reportedly using facial recognition to catch repeat offenders. And more entertainment venues are using the tool at ticket gates, including First Energy Stadium in Cleveland, City Field in New York, and the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. It's very, very difficult to find a pin in a haystack, so to speak, at a large uh, venue or a large event. So, yeah, I think you're going to continue to see the technology distributed. The owner of Madison Square Garden has been under fire for using facial recognition to identify and remove people. Those removed include lawyers involved in litigation against MSG. For law enforcement, there's some huge, huge positives. On the negative side and the concerning side, we've got a real challenge potentially around how that data is utilized, especially if it's put in the wrong hands. Something else to think about at the grocery store. Rhiannon, thank you for that. For anyone who's ever watched pro wrestling, you may have wondered, where do they get these folks? Where do they come from? And while it may be a stage sport, it certainly takes a lot of athleticism to succeed in the world of wrestling. So tonight, we take you inside the ring to a New Jersey gym churning out potential future stars. Lindsay Davis has it. In a small gym in South Jersey, Danny Cage is transforming regular people into monsters. This is where the dreams are made, the dreams are crushed. I'm not walking you through this, I'm just going. You guys go. Ready? Go. Yeah. 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 So let's do that again, sped up. It's called the Monster Factory, and some of the biggest names in pro wrestling have trained here. 
These guys right here, the headbangers, they put me through my trial in 1994. Seamus, I was training with him at the Monster Factory back in like 2003 and four. Big Show, Bam Bam Bigelow, you name it, they're here. This is the legacy of the Monster Factory. Danny used to be a wrestler himself, and now he's training a new crop of young wrestlers. Good, good. And pulling back the curtain on pro wrestling with a new documentary series on Apple TV Plus. Four years ago, little Goldie walked through the doors of the Monster Factory. Little 17-year-old Goldie walked into a land of giants, a land of monsters. And I, I was scared. I was intimidated. I wanted to quit every single day I came in here. But here we are, four years later. I look at everyone here, and I don't see these giants that I once saw. I don't see these monsters. And maybe it's not that the giants are gone. Maybe it's not that the monsters are gone. Maybe it's that I am now that giant. It's no secret that professional wrestling is a scripted and carefully rehearsed routine. Flip that hair back, Abby. Get your face on camera. <laughs> there you go. But it still hurts. Yeah, you can get hurt. Of course you can. It's This is like, this is not a trampoline. This isn't a mattress. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Pro wrestling is very much a coordinated and scripted sport, but it's still like it takes a lot of athletics and a lot of trust in the other person you're working with, and it's our real bodies that we're beating up and throwing around. It's entertainment. It's an escape. There's no cut. There's no stunt doubles. There's none of that. These wrestlers train almost every day. Yay! paying $7,500 for a lifetime membership to the gym. But for them, it's become more than a sport. To be honest with you, wrestling saved my life. I was gonna, I was gonna end it. Wrestling is kind of the only thing that gave me what I always wanted but never felt like I got, which was acceptance. And I could just be me and be accepted. I think that the unique thing about the Monster Factory is Danny treats everybody that comes in here as equals. 17-year-old David is very different than 22-year-old Goldie now. I've been wrestling five years now. If you saw me then, you wouldn't recognize me. I don't recognize myself. You're pretty good, Goldie. You, Bobby. Where I come from, a city that like a lot of people don't see themselves out of it. I think one of the best things about wrestling as a whole is that it gave me a broader scope of the world like past the environment that I was raised in. I love it. This is my favorite thing in the whole world, but it beats up your body, it takes all your time, and it is financially draining for no reason. So if you don't love wrestling, don't do it. I remember the first moment I stepped in here, I'm like, oh, this is home. First time I seen a practice match, then I felt more in love than the first time I got in, it's like, whoa. Everybody I've ever bumped into who gets to learn something about wrestling, I had no idea it was like this. Once you see what this is all about, you'll fall in love with it. For sure, it takes a lot of strength and athleticism. Lindsay, thank you so much for that. And you can tune in to Monster Factory, streaming now on Apple TV+. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, a report on the man who police say wanted to turn a parade into a horror scene and how police were able to stop him. And a second arrest made in the cold-blooded murder of a Microsoft executive. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? 
Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. The whole world saw me as a sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. It was almost like you were hiding in plain sight. I just wanted to be someone else. But when you tell your truth and let things go, it really will help heal you. In her own words, this is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A federal judge has ruled that a lawyer for former President Donald Trump must provide additional testimony before a federal grand jury investigating Trump's handling of classified document, documents. A Trump spokesperson did not immediately respond to a request for comment. A 17-year-old has been arrested in the fatal shooting of a transgender woman as Houston police continue to search for a second suspect. Maricela Castro was found lying in the road outside a home in July of 2022. According to police, Castro and another person had just gotten out of her car when she was shot. The two male suspects took off in Castro's car before ditching it nearby. The teen, who was 16 at the time of the shooting, is now in custody on a capital murder charge. Police would not comment on a possible motive. Lance Reddick, star of The Wire and John Wick franchise, has died at the age of 60. The actor's representative confirmed his death, saying he, quote, passed away suddenly this morning from natural causes. Reddick is survived by his wife and two children. The Kremlin may be calling the ICC arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin over alleged war crimes null and void, but it's something for China's Xi Jinping to think about as he heads to Moscow for the first time since the Russian president ordered that invasion. ABC's James Longman has more from, from Ukraine. Tonight, humiliation for Vladimir Putin, the International Criminal Court issuing an arrest warrant for the Russian president seeking to put him behind bars. Judges at The Hague alleging Putin has committed a war crime for the unlawful transfer of children from occupied areas of Ukraine to the Russian Federation. It is forbidden by international law for occupied powers to transfer civilians from the territory they live in to other territories. Children enjoy special protection under the Geneva Convention. The U.S. State Department says thousands of children and perhaps over a million adults have allegedly been forcibly deported from Ukraine to Russia. But the foreign ministry in Moscow has brushed off the warrant, calling the court's decisions legally null and void. The arrest warrant perhaps just the beginning of the international community's efforts to bring Putin to justice. Vice President Kamala Harris last month accused Russian forces of committing crimes against humanity in places like Bucha, citing murder, torture and rape. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five bodies in this tiny room in this basement where Ukrainians say people have been 
tortured and I can see their hands behind their backs. It is a truly apocalyptic scene. It's just absolutely horrific in here. And this is what Ukraine says is happening across this country. Yet today, Putin sought to present himself as commander, not criminal. He announced he'll host China's President Xi on Monday for a state visit. The Kremlin saying the two leaders plan to sign joint declarations, deepening, quote, strategic cooperation. Putin hoping that translates into assistance on the battlefield that his depleted forces badly need. But Xi has positioned himself as a peacemaker in recent weeks, and he can't do that if, as some fear, he does the Kremlin's bidding. Also today, after months of asking, Ukraine now being promised fighter jets. Poland and Slovakia in the last 36 hours have become the first two NATO allies to promise immediate delivery of Soviet-era MiG fighter jets. And Phil, the National Security Council issued a statement a short while ago to ABC News saying there is no doubt that Russia is committing war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine. And we've been clear that those responsible must be held accountable. Phil. James Longman from Ukraine. James, thank you. All right, let's bring in ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Martha, what impact could this have on Vladimir Putin and Russia? Well, Putin is by far the most powerful person ever issued an arrest warrant by the International Court. He joins the ranks of people like the late Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, and that was 12 years ago. But many of those issued warrants in the past are militia leaders and some affiliated with al-Qaeda. And even though an arrest is not going to happen anytime soon, if ever, and even though Russia does not recognize this court, this is a cloak of shame that will stay with Putin forever. And on a practical note, it could limit his travel overseas and it could isolate him further. Of course, it comes in the middle of the war in Ukraine where Russia has suffered huge losses. And right after the U.S. released that video showing the reckless behavior of Russian pilots and right before he is to meet with China's president, which could limit what China will do to assist Russia in the war in terms of providing weapons, Phil. All right, Martha Raddatz, thank you. Next tonight, to the concern over the stability of America's banks still being felt across the country, specifically on Wall Street, one week after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, it, its former parent company now filing for bankruptcy. And there's a new report that claims First Republic executives actually sold $12 million in stock months before the crash. Ariel Reshef reports. Tonight, Wall Street closing out the week with a rocky ride. Stock plunging nearly 400 points, even after that $30 billion rescue of the troubled First Republic Bank by the country's biggest banks. There's still a lot of angst in the marketplace. I think there are some investors uh, worried that we may see a bank failure or two this weekend. President Biden today pushing Congress to impose tougher penalties on executives at failed banks, including giving regulators the power to claw back gains from their stock sales. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again. It comes after a report from the Wall Street Journal that executives at First Republic sold $12 million in stock in the months leading up to its crash. But that bank is still operating and those executives are still in charge. First Republic telling us they have no comment on those stock sales. I feel confident that the regulators are looking at this and I, again, I would be surprised if they weren't. Today, the parent company of Silicon Valley filing for bankruptcy as the Department of Justice and the SEC investigate its leadership. CEO Greg Becker sold nearly $3.6 million in stock just days before the bank collapsed. Sources tell ABC News the FBI is looking into whether there is evidence of insider trading. And Ariel Reshef joins us now. Ariel, the Biden administration is asking Congress to take further action here, right? That's right, Phil. The White House is asking Congress to empower the FDIC to impose fines on those executives of failed banks and to bar them from holding jobs in the industry. Phil? All right. Ariel, thank you. Now to the battle over TikTok. Sources telling ABC News that the Justice Department is launching an investigation into the owners of the popular social media app for allegedly spying on journalists. The news follows an apparent warning from the Biden administration to potentially ban TikTok if its Chinese parent company doesn't sell its stake. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the China-based company that owns TikTok under investigation by the FBI for allegedly spying on American citizens. 
Sources telling ABC News the Justice Department is looking into whether ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, was tracking and mining information about reporters who covered the tech industry. This is the nation's top intelligence official warns that TikTok makes Americans vulnerable to spying. One third of Americans get their news from TikTok every single day. One sixth of American youth say they're constantly on TikTok. That's a, that's a loaded gun. The fear that TikTok has been vacuuming volumes of personal detailed information about all those users. Information that could be exploited by China to manipulate what Americans think. And sources tell ABC News the Biden administration is threatening to ban TikTok completely unless the Chinese owners give up their stake. But some lawmakers say just ban it now. For me personally, I think they need to be gone. Uh, that, you know, China's our number one adversary. We need to protect ourselves. TikTok officials have said in recent days that they are addressing the privacy concerns about Americans and that forcing the China-based parent company to divest would not address the security concerns raised by U.S. officials. Phil? All right, Pierre, thank you. And now to the alleged plot here at home with authorities revealing a, a plan they say was targeting St. Patrick's Day. The FBI arresting a suspect in Yonkers, New York, accusing him of threatening to kill police officers during tomorrow's parade. The suspect allegedly posting alarming messages on social media. Here's ABC's investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Tonight on this St. Patrick's Day, the FBI arresting this axe-wielding man for threatening to attack police officers marching in Saturday's St. Patrick's Day parade in Yonkers. The message is, is clear. It will be taken seriously, and you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. That's what we do. In online posts, federal prosecutors say Ridon Kola mentioned jihad, referenced ISIS, and expressed support for Cephalo Saipov, who carried out the 2017 bike path terror attack in New York City that killed eight people. Saipov was recently sentenced to life in prison. Earlier this month, court records quoted a message Kola allegedly sent to Yonkers police saying, I will crucify Yonkers cops and their bosses all along McLean Avenue. It will be a horror scene. McLean Avenue is where Saturday's parade steps off. A few days later, Kola posted this picture of himself with an axe and a caption in Albanian that says, Come on, Judas, I'm waiting for you. Aaron Katursky joins me now. Aaron, what's happened with this suspect and will the parade go on? Oh, the parade is very much going on tomorrow as scheduled. The suspect is now being held without bail pending a, a hearing next week, Phil. And the mayor tonight says that these threats are not going to curtail the community celebration of Irish Americans. So they'll be on McLean Avenue on Saturday as scheduled. Phil. All right, Aaron, thank you. We're going to turn now to new questions about the possible origins of COVID-19. An international team of scientists is now looking at some new data. They say they've discovered genetic links tying the pandemic to another animal in Wuhan, China, and not a lab. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the details. Tonight, new evidence that COVID-19 may have originated from natural animal to human transmission after new analysis suggests a link from the virus to raccoon dogs at China's Wuhan market. This is another big brick in a huge wall of evidence pointing to this market as the epicenter uh, and to wildlife uh, as the, the source of this pandemic. The findings first reported by The Atlantic after researcher Michael Warby and a group of scientists analyzed new data uploaded just days ago into a global database by researchers at China's CDC. That data, including swab samples taken in and around Wuhan market back in January of 2020. We found some pretty interesting things, including raccoon dog and other mammal DNA and samples that have SARS-CoV-2. The preliminary findings and data not yet published or peer-reviewed. Tonight, the WHO and experts say the findings are strong evidence, but do not prove conclusively raccoon dogs transmitted the virus to humans or had COVID-19 themselves. These data do not provide a definitive answer to the question of how the pandemic began. The news coming amid fierce debate over where the virus came from. The Department of Energy now joining the FBI, saying with low confidence they suspect the pandemic most likely started with a lab leak in China. And Stephanie Ramos joins me now. Stephanie, this new information is also renewing questions about transparency when it comes to the origin of COVID. 
It really is, Phil. Chinese researchers reportedly uploaded that data and then for some reason took it down after that international team was able to analyze it. The WHO is now calling for China to share any and all information relating to COVID-19 and its origin. Phil. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Next tonight to the severe weather threat in the south after that cross-country storm unleashed a tornado and large hail in the Dallas area. And now a major cold blast is right behind it. Let's get to ABC meteorologist Samara Theodore with what we can expect. Samara. That's right, Phil. So that line of severe weather has now moved into the Florida panhandle and it's getting ready to exit before it does. Some showers are anticipated along the I-95 corridor, but behind it, that cold air is going to surge in and we'll see it as far south as areas like East Texas into Louisiana and parts of southern Alabama. Saturday morning, wind chills will be down to the single digits and below zero in parts of the upper Midwest. And we're already starting to see freeze watches and alerts going off for parts of the southeast from Memphis, Nashville into areas like Raleigh and Atlanta. Sunday morning, just as cold. Temperatures feeling like the single digits and below zero again in parts of the Northeast and even feeling like the teens as far south as North Georgia. We're getting ready to gear up for the first day of spring, Phil, but it's still feeling like deep winter. All right, Samara, thanks so much. Now to the new twist in the killing of a former Microsoft executive found shot to death last year on a Florida street. The husband of the victim's ex-wife is now under arrest and facing murder charges. ABC's Trevor Alt has more. A stunning second arrest in the death of Microsoft executive and father of four, Jared Bridegan. Authorities charging Mario Fernandez Saldana, the husband of Bridegan's ex-wife, with planning his murder. In addition to the first degree murder charge, the grand jury also has indicted Fernandez Saldana for conspiracy to commit first degree murder, solicitation to commit a capital felony, as well as child abuse. Investigators describe Bridegan's murder as a targeted ambush. They say last February, after Bridegan dropped off two of his children at his ex-wife's house, this tire blocked the road on his way home. When he stopped, presumably to move it, he was suddenly gunned down in cold blood, his two-year-old daughter still in the back seat. In January, authorities arrested Henry Tennant for allegedly pulling the trigger, but also said at the time, We know Henry Tennant did not act alone. Investigators now confirm Fernandez Saldana was previously Henry Tenen's landlord and claim he was the single link tying Tenen to Jared Bridegan. According to the arrest warrant, Fernandez Saldana and Tenen had 35 phone contacts the month Bridegan was killed, with dozens more in the months that followed. Thursday, Tenen pleaded guilty to second-degree murder with a deadly weapon, officials saying he's agreed to testify truthfully against the people he worked with to murder Jared Bridegan. Tenen's cooperation has both corroborated evidence collected during the investigation and provided additional evidence against Mario Fernandez Saldana for his role in the planning and execution of Jared's murder. Following Tannen's January arrest, ABC News asked Bridegan's widow, Kirsten, about the couple's relationship with Fernandez Saldana. We had limited interactions with Mario. Um, it was usually when we would pick up the kids. Um, we avoided contact with Mario as much as possible. She declined to elaborate further at the time, and Thursday, after his arrest, she said the family is feeling many heavy emotions. We have great relief knowing that two of the people behind my husband's murders are now behind bars and are no longer a threat to our family. We are also still angry, angry that they were walking free, angry that our youngest, who was six months at the time of his death, will have no memories of her father. Our thanks to Trevor Alt for that. There is still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, the sleep interrupters that could be stopping you from getting a good night's rest. But next, the massive protests underway in Paris, why people are taking to the streets for yet another day and burning the image of their country's leader. We'll go around the world. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Katmandu.
man doing the post. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Chicago, I'm Alex Perez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. A village in Malawi was washed away by a landslide following severe floods caused by Cyclone Freddy that devastated homes. The storm swept through the region, killing more than 400 people in Malawi, Mozambique, and Madagascar. Since it's first made landfall in Africa in late February, it actually circled back and hit the region for a second time over the weekend. Protesters faced off against riot police as new demonstrations against the French government's plan to raise the state pension age in Paris. A large cutout figure of French President Emmanuel Macron was thrown into the fire pit and a large barrel was then rolled through the gap in the crowd toward the police line. The overhaul would raise the pension age by two years to 64, which the government says is essential to ensure the system does not go bust. New Zealand announcing it will ban TikTok on devices with access to the country's parliamentary network due to cybersecurity concerns becoming the latest nation to limit the use of the app. Concerns have mounted globally about the potential for the Chinese government to access users' location and contact data through ByteDance, TikTok's Chinese parent company. So there are so many reasons you may be losing sleep at night, so many. So what are some of the potential solutions to get you a better night's rest? Here's ABC's Becky Worley. Bad sleep is most commonly attributed to stress, caffeine, or alcohol. But beyond those known culprits, what are some other things that could be disrupting your sleep? We sleep best under cool conditions, dark conditions, and where it's quiet. Quiet is a big one. A very small study in 2015 looked at the noise disruptions from pets in the bedroom. About 20% of pet owners said dog or cat activity in the night woke them up. This was a revelation to me because I didn't realize that every time my dog moved or scratched himself in the night, it was waking me up. Solution? You can take their collar off each night, or even better, a neoprene tag cover. Costs just a buck fifty. And if it's your cat waking you up, meow. You know, usually they have an insistent request to be fed. So this automatic feeder could keep them from being your way too early alarm clock. Another factor doctors cite for sleep disruption, allergens. That might include dust mites in your mattress, other things from the ambient environment, or even pet dander, which can disrupt sleep quality and also exacerbate sleep disordered breathing. Solution, an air filter in the bedroom. And consider protective mattress and pillow covers that keep irritants at bay. These have gotten a lot better than they used to be. It's not like a plastic sheet at all. It feels like cloth, hardly noticeable. Temperature is a big consideration in sleep, and experts say cool is good, but there's no one perfect temp. <sighs> Notice if you wake up a little sweaty or with cold feet, and adjust your thermostat or what you wear to bed. Another common disruptor, pain. Back pain, headaches, and jaw pain are all common. Not only is it sort of intuitive that pain can disrupt your sleep, 
but we also know that sleep disturbances can further exacerbate your pain symptoms. So you can have this vicious cycle. So prioritize managing your pain. And in some cases, doctors say gentle stretching before bed, even using a foam roller can help. All right, Becky, thanks for that. And still to come, a little Marvel magic as we take you inside the new home for letters mailed to Spider-Man's address in nearby Queens, New York. I've never talked about this out loud with anyone in an interview, so it's weird to talk about. The whole world saw me as a sex symbol, but inside I didn't feel that way at all. It was almost like you were hiding in plain sight. I just wanted to be someone else. But when you tell your truth and let things go, it really will help heal you. There is something in her own words. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. For decades, a home in New York City has received hundreds of letters written to Spider-Man. That's because a 1989 edition of Marvel Comics listed 20 Ingram Street in Forest Hills, Queens as Peter Parker's address. Now, those letters will be displayed at a New York City museum. Stefan Kim from our partner station, WABC, has more on the story in tonight's local lowdown. Dear Spider-Man, I think you are the best superhero. Dear Spider-Man, can you send me a costume? They're among the hundreds and hundreds of letters to Spider-Man from all over the world, from Kentucky, from the Netherlands, from India, and now they're part of the Dear Spider-Man Letters to Peter Parker exhibit. Some of them are really hoping that Spider-Man can provide the equipment that they need, <laughs> right? And so, like, uh, in particular, he's known for the web slinger, yeah, right? Okay. And uh, kids want to be able to shoot that web. Dave Herman is the founder of the City Reliquary Museum in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Our board member Pamela Parker grew up in this household. It was her mother, Suzanne Parker, who actually started getting some of these letters and thinking uh, they were odd at first, maybe a prank. The Parkers moved into 20 Ingram Street in Forest Hills, Queens in 1974, but Peter Parker's home address wasn't revealed until 1989. You had to be a true fan that's following it from issue to issue to see the subsequent issue where you actually see the other half of the change of address form and you get to put those two pieces together. Herman says the comic book writers deny any connection, but he thinks they likely wanted to keep the story authentic and maybe pick the name and address out of the phone book. I knew Suzanne Parker uh -huh. and I sold um, the house from Suzanne Parker uh -huh. to the current owner. As soon as the, um, the comic book, you I know, see identified 20 Ingram as the as the Spider-Man house, then like, everything came flooded. <laughs> the house is listed again, by the way, and again, Malik is the agent. It does not add any value, <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. In fact, 20 Ingram has become so synonymous with Spider-Man that over the years, the Parkers even received credit card offers addressed to Peter Parker. Even mail simply addressed to Peter Parker in Forest Hills made it to this mailbox. At a certain point, you start to realize like the, the postal service is in cahoots here. Stefan Kim, thank you from WABC. That's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com.